Well, it's great to have you guys all here. Um, and I thought I'd talk about, start with super big picture on my field and then zoom in on some more recent stuff we're doing. In past times I've spoken here, I've, d I've talked about more basic things about functional MRI experiments and how you do them. But actually a lot of that stuff is online at my website. And so I thought I'd talk more about ongoing stuff in my lab. And um, I don't think it'll be too hard, but I, I don't know. I haven't tried that in this venue before. So you just stop me if I say anything that doesn't make sense, OK? Because I don't actually do anything complicated. Um, most of you know much more math and computer science than I do. So if there's anything complicated that's, that you don't understand, it's my fault, not yours. And stop me, and I'll clear it up. All right, so I want to start by making the simple point that we have ha made a huge amount of progress in human cognitive neuroscience in the last 20 years. And to appreciate that, it helps to step back to what we knew um, just a couple decades ago. This is a kind of diagram of the functional organization of the brain and what we knew about what functions were where in the brain around 1990. So we knew mostly from studies of patients who had the great misfortune of having damage to the brain, that if you have damage somewhere back here, you might lose your ability to recognize faces uh, and maintain your ability to recognize words and objects and scenes and even to recognize people by their voices, just not to be able to recognize faces. Right? And we knew like for 200 years that if you had damage to the lateral part of the left hemisphere, particularly in the temporal and frontal lobes, uh, you might have problems with language. And third, if you have damage up here, as you guys in the Desimone lab know, in the parietal lobes, you would have problems with visual attention, with attending to different parts of space. So that was kind of it. That's sort of what we knew about where the different functions were in the brain. And importantly, that could have been it. Like back in 1990, it wasn't obvious that if we had methods to look at a finer grain, that there would be much more functional organization to be discovered. Maybe that's all there was and everything else is kind of doing all the different functions on top of each other without any kind of real functional organization. But then functional MRI came along. And you guys have a basic idea of what functional MRI is. It looks at neural activity by way of blood flow. So just as when you exercise, your muscles need extra blood flow to supply the muscles. When you exercise, when a part of your brain, when you make a bunch of neurons fire, you need to send more blood flow there. And we measure that with functional MRI machines. Right. OK, so functional MRI has given us this picture of the brain. So there are now dozens of regions of the cortex for which we have a pretty good idea of what that patch of cortex does. Yeah? And uh, each, and many of them are like quite specific mental functions. And each of those regions are present in more or less the same location in pretty much any normal person. We could pop any of you in the scanner and in a few scanning sessions, it might take two or three, one to two hour sessions, we'd make that map in your brain. Yeah? And it would be a, you know, more or less like that. Um, so this is highly schematic. We don't have neat little colored ovals with sharp edges in the brain. So let me show you what some actual data is th that I mean by this. OK, you have the basics of functional MRI. I threw this in, but I don't think we need it. Here is one of my current lab techs, uh, the bottom of his brain. Um, so this is his uh, right hemisphere and left hemisphere, back of the brain, front of the brain, back, front. It's all smooth because we've mathematically taken the cortex, which is all crumpled up in the brain. Right, Cortex is a sheet, size of a large pizza. To fit it in your head, you have to crumple it up. Okay. And so when you do brain imaging, we want to see the organization of that whole sheet uncrumpled, so we mathematically unfold it. Okay, so this is a mathematically inflated brain. The dark bits are the bits that used to be inside a fold until we undid the fold, and the light bits are the bits that were out on the surface. So that's the bottom, bottom surface of the brain showing a bunch of regions that have different functions. So what are the data behind this idea? Well, that little blue patch right there that's the fusiform face area. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, and the reason we call it the fusiform face area is it lives on that bump in the brain called the fusiform gyrus. And it responds like this. Here's its MRI response um, to faces, to bodies, and to a bunch of other stimuli, objects and scenes and words and other kinds of stuff. So you can see just looking at that, that region responds more to faces than anything else. OK? So pretty basic, right? Um, so that's what we mean when we say that region responds specifically to faces. Right next door is another patch of cortex right there in the parahippocampal cortex. 
and it responds a whole bunch more to scenes than bodies and objects and other things. And it responds zero to faces. Zero just means the same as our baseline, which is a condition where you're lying in the scanner staring at a dot and nothing else is happening. Right? You can't turn your brain off, but that's our approximation of zero for the visual cortex. Okay. Um, over here in the left hemisphere, in a region kind of like the, the uh, face area, is a region called the visual word form area. And that's a really interesting part of the brain. It's the one part of the brain where we know that the selectivity of that piece of brain is wired up by that individual's experience. And we know that first. Here's the response of that region to visually presented words, to letter strings, faces, bodies, scenes, and other things. So it runs speci responds specifically to letters and letter strings. It doesn't care if it's a meaningful word or just a string of letters. So it's not about the meaning. It's about the visual form of letters. Okay? And the reason that we know that that thing is trained up by experience rather than kind of innately wired up, say, at birth, is first of all, you don't see it in five-year-olds who haven't yet learned to read. You bring them back when they're seven or eight and they've learned to read and you find that region. Second, um, if you scan people who read uh, only English words, not Hebrew words, that region responds strongly to English words, not to Hebrew words, which have different orthography. But if you scan people who read both, it responds strongly to both. So we know that that, that means that that region is wired up by the individual's experience. Right? And we'll get back to that question later. Out on the lateral surface of the brain, there's a whole bunch of other good stuff. So that little purple blob out there responds selectively to pictures of bodies and body parts compared to faces and scenes and words and everything else. Okay. Now you might think, um, is this just about vision? No, it's not just about vision. That little orange patch up there on the lateral temporal lobe responds strongly to speech sounds, that when you hear speech sounds, whether it's a, um, uh, your own native language or a foreign language you don't understand. So that's the sounds of speech, not the meanings of language that it responds to. And so then you might say, okay, fine. These are all kind of perceptual processors. They process visual information and auditory information, and they tell us about things that we're perceiving. Would we ever get brain specializations for thinking, for higher level mental functions, not just for perceiving, but for thinking, uh, or other aspects of abstract cognition? So enter the fray of Fedorenko, who was a postdoc in my lab a bunch of years ago. She's now a faculty member in this department, and she's awesome. And she asked the basic question of whether those language regions of the brain, which have been known, as I said, for 200 years since this discovery that damage out here can produce language problems. She said, are those language regions really specific for language per se? Or do you use those language regions when you do all kinds of other kinds of thinking, like say arithmetic or listening to music or holding information and working memory, et cetera, okay? So what she did was, she figured out how to identify those regions in each subject individually. And then, okay, and so here they are. Um, back here, this is basically, if you've heard of it, Wernicke's area and Broca's area up there, responding to um, auditory, um, auditory and visual sentences, right? Compared to auditory or visual gobbledygook with no meaning, okay? So then Ev says, okay, is, is, are those regions really about language per se or do they do all this other stuff? So she tested a whole bunch of other tasks, and I won't go through the details, but there's arithmetic and music and working memory of various kinds and all kinds of other tasks that aren't language per se. And she measured the response of those language regions to all these other tasks. And so here's what she finds. Here's what Wernicke's area does up there. In black, that's the response when you read sentences, and that's when you read nonsense words that have no meaning. So that's why we think it responds to language meaning. And here's its response to all those other tasks. Big bunch of nothing, right? And up there in the frontal lobe, in Broca's area, we get the same thing. Strong response when you understand sentences, almost no response when you do any of these other things, okay? So that says that these language regions are really pretty damn specific for language per se, yeah? And I think that's cool because it's not just another bunch of blobs that I can stick on a brain and say, oh, more specific blobs, much as I like to do that. I do like to do that. <laughs> but I think these specific blobs are particularly interesting 
because they answer a question um, that probably all of you have wondered about, which is what is the relationship between language and thought? Like, who hasn't wondered about that? Right? Can you think without language? Is language the same thing as thought? What's up with that? Right? These data say that as far as the brain is concerned, the parts, of the, <clears throat> the parts of the brain that are involved in understanding language are just completely different than the parts of the brain that are involved in all other kinds of thought. Right? Uh, all the ones we tested. We're still at it. She's still at it. But you know, all the ones that tested so far. Uh, and actually, even stronger evidence that language and thought are not the same thing in the brain comes from work, not ours, but from uh, a scientist in England named Rosemary Varley. And she has been testing a set of people um, with global aphasia. This is like the big pink blobs I showed you at the beginning, people with massive left hemisphere strokes that just knock out all of those language regions. It's very horrible. You hope it never happens to anyone you care about. Um, but when, when it does happen occasionally, and she has been testing several of these people, and what she finds is she figures out how to communicate. So these are people, it's not just they can't produce language. They can't understand language, produce it. They just have no language. And so she's figured out how to ask them to do all kinds of other tasks um, through charades and diagrams and other ways of communicating with them. And she finds that pretty much every task she tries, um, higher level difficult cognitive tasks, they can do without language. They can do arithmetic problems. They can do logic problems. They can navigate. They can appreciate music. They can think about what another person is thinking. Right? So they can do all this abstract high level stuff without language, which is pretty cool. And I think even more evidence that language and thought are not the same thing. Yeah? Um, OK, so conti continuing our um, whirlwind tour of the brain, um, perhaps the most astonishing uh, part of the brain, as far as I'm concerned, was discovered by Rebecca Sachs, Brendan's working with. And that's this little pink patch right there. And that region responds only when you think about what another person is thinking. And what's amazing about Rebecca's work on that region is how specific it is. So she's shown in a whole suite of experiments that it doesn't get active when you think about what other people look like or what even bodily sensations, like is that person hungry or thirsty or in pain? Not interested in that. It's only when you think about the content of their thought, what are they thinking, right? And so that's pretty astonishing. Um, both because it's a uniquely human function, it's highly abstract, um, and there it is with its own private patch of the brain. Yeah? Is that the only brain area that's active when you think about it? Okay, good question. Um, there are a bunch of regions. Um, Rebecca has a really nice review article. If you send me an email, I'll send you a link to it. It's on her page, but there's a million papers in there. And there are basically five that respond uh, when you think about uh, other people's thoughts. There's this region bilaterally. It's bigger on the right than the left, but you get it on both sides. There's a region deep down in the middle of the brain in the precuneus. And there's other stuff up in the frontal lobe up there. But in further testing, the, this one here, which she calls the RTPJ, is the most specific one. So those other ones respond a little bit when you think about you know, whether a person is in pain or you know, some other things. Um, uh, but this one is the most specific for just thinking about what other people are thinking. Okay, so it's not the case that every single patch of the cortex does something ridiculously specific. Some of them do, but not all of them. Um, all of that white stuff up there, um, all of those regions are kind of like the opposite of the colored regions. Those white regions are engaged pretty much whenever you do anything difficult, almost independent of what it is. And so they're like completely indiscriminate. It's like you do a difficult task, those regions step up. It's almost like, you know, your brain's CPU or something like that. I mean, we don't know what that means or what it is, but um, they're very, very general purpose engaged in lots of different, different tasks. Um, so it's not the whole brain that does that. Here's a bunch of different tasks with in solid bars, a difficult version in the outline bars, uh, an easy version across a bunch of very different domains. And you see almost no matter what you're doing, they're more active in a more difficult task than an easy task. OK, so that's the whirlwind overview. So where has that gotten us? I think that's real progress. Now we have this sketch of the functional organization of the human brain that we didn't have 20 years ago. That's cool. Um, we have this set of functionally distinctive regions that are pre present in more or less the same place in everyone. That's cool. 
Some of those regions are abstract and you know, carry out abstract and uniquely human functions like language and thinking about each other's thoughts. That's cool too. And I like this because I think this is kind of an initial sketch of who we are as thinkers. This is, I think of this as a diagram of the human mind, right? An initial beginning one. It needs more work, but it's a first, first rough draft. Um, but at the same time, it's a barest beginning. And if you just look at that, I'm sure you guys can come up with a million next questions to ask, right? It's not enough to take a patch of brain and say, okay, that bit does faces, that bit does scenes. It's like, okay, wow. so many questions, right? Um, so I look at this as actually a, a, also a diagram of the human mind, but also a diagram of a research program. Like, what does this mean exactly? What are all those other questions, okay? So I'll mention just a few of them, and then we'll zoom in on just a few for the rest of the talk. Okay, so um, first of all, everything I've talked about so far, or most of what I've talked about, is functional MRI, where we measure neural responses when people do different things. That's great, it's awesome. But it doesn't tell us that that region is necessary for that task, right? And so we wanna know the causal role of, of each region in each function. We wanna know, okay, that's a nice start, but what else is in there? What other crazy specializations are in the brain? And so, you know, you can think of your own hypotheses and we're thinking of ours and testing them. Um, how do you wire this thing up in development? Like all this systematic structure, sort of the same in pretty much every normal person. How do a smallish number of genes and some experience produce that similar structure in everybody? Big, massive mystery. Uh, and lots of other questions. What's represented in each region? What's computed in each region? How are they connected to each other? How do they interact? And a question I won't talk about today unless you ask me more about it, why is that a good way to design a brain in the first place? Right, I used to end every talk by saying, okay, now we've learned all of this, but why? Is it, why are brains like that? Why does that make sense computationally? And whenever I ended talks that way, I would sort of think, okay, I would really, that's the question I would most love to answer and I have no idea how to go about it. But just in the last six months, I think there's a way. And I have a postdoc who started thinking about that using deep nets as kind of proxies for optimal systems and asking under what circumstances deep nets end up dividing tasks in the way that we see in the human brain. It's very early days in that enterprise. It's just like a little, a little pointer that stay tuned. I'm hoping we'll make progress even on that why question. Yeah, you had a question? So in the different tasks that you talked about before, are areas activated all at the same time? Or you can see areas activated later on? Yeah, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing a visual task, like if I flash a face on the screen, you're staring at a dot, you're looking at the screen, you're ready, I flash on a face. Okay, with functional MRI, we couldn't tell because its temporal resolution is terrible. But with other methods, mostly methods in monkeys and occasionally methods in humans, what we'd see is You'd first, you'd first register in the retina within a few tens of milliseconds. Then it would go down to a piece of the thalamus deep in the bottom of the brain called the lateral geniculate nucleus, the first step up from the retina, you know, 10 milliseconds later. And then it would land up in primary visual cortex right back here in the back of the head at around 60, 70 milliseconds after stimulus onset, less than a tenth of a second. It's passing along synapse to synapse as it goes up to the, so now we're up in the cortex. And then once you get in the into the cortex, all hell breaks loose. Information goes all over the place, right? Broadly speaking, for visual information, some of it goes up here into the parietal lobe, and some of it goes down into the temporal lobe. But you know, it, it progresses you know, as it goes up the stage. So you don't get uh, responses in the fusiform face area right there until um, around 130, 40, 50 milliseconds after stimulus onset. We can't see any of that with functional MRI. Functional MRI blurs information over hundreds of milliseconds, so we take all that stuff and just squash it over time. It's a real drag. But other methods can reveal that kind of stuff. But if you are predicting what you're going to see, you may be possible that you get activated before. Even before, great question, absolutely, yeah. Um, Yes, and I'm sure you would get that. Here's the, I, don't, I can't think of this, uh, the right study to tell you about right now, but here's a study we did that's not exactly that question, but it's related. Um, when we first found those face and scene responsive, face and place regions way back, we said, hey, can you turn those things on if you close your eyes and just imagine a face or imagine a place, right? 
10% of people say they have no idea what everyone else is talking about when they say that. They can't see pictures in the head. Like, what is everybody else on about? That's baloney. So if you're one of those people, you, you know, you're not alone. But if you're in the 90% who can like close your eyes and imagine, you know, the, the room that you're staying in right now or imagine, you know, Mandana's face right now. I've got her right there. She is so vivid. It's like looking at her. <laughs> in fact, it's more vivid because when I look at her now, she's farther away. It's better in my mental image. Okay. So we scan people doing that task. And when you imagine a face, you turn on your face area. And when you imagine a place, you turn on your place area. So that tells us you can get into those regions, not just bottom up off your sensory apparatus, but from the you know, tops of your uh, higher level mental stages, you can somehow feed back down into there. That's not exactly the same as your question about prediction, but you'd probably get it for prediction too. Yeah. Perhaps this is a more personal question, but do you believe there is some sort of threshold in these sections, or could we continue developing it throughout our entire lives? Like by the time, for example, we hit our early teens, is it as developed as it will be or can be, or can we continue learning and developing these areas and we, okay. you know, make, make it perhaps um, increasing our functions into working together? Like, what do you think? On yeah. That? Well, there's a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you take that face area, for example, um, that face area continues to develop surprisingly long, like at least until age eight. Most people would say, you know, 12 or beyond, right? <laughs> it gets bigger and more selective with time. That's kind of a puzzle because five-year-olds are really good at face recognition. So if the behavioral function is there, what the hell's going on as, as it changes? But it does, it gets more selective uh, over time, okay? Um, and uh, it's a big mystery I'll, that I'll talk about at the end if I get there um, about, I won't answer it, I'll just raise it and dance around it in various ways, um, of how much that development is due to experience with faces and how much is due to maturation, right? Because does everybody understand the basic point that if something continues to develop well after birth or maybe only shows up many years after birth, that doesn't mean it's due to experience. It might be. It might be that you learned it from experience. Or maybe it's just maturation, right? Think about puberty, right? When you're somewhere between 11, 13, whatever, puberty hits, it's not that you learned it. Okay, you have to eat and some basic things to be healthy enough, right? But there's some developmental autopilot that's just gonna unfold over time. It's not based on your experience, right? Okay, and so we don't know, just because things continue to change later in life, it could be on some innate developmental autopilot, or it could be that you're just accruing experience and training up those patches of the brain. Everybody get that idea? So it's a big mystery. Yeah. Yeah? Do we have any, do we have any uh, good idea how, what controls which brain is activating? How, or how, do you how do they know? Huh? You mean how do those regions know when to turn on? Yeah, what controls? Um, uh, well, there are some things we know. So I haven't mentioned yet the fact that these things are all connected up in very particular ways, okay? Um, and so I did mention it with the case of vision in answer to the, the time course, right? There's a particular visual pathway coming into the cortex and then a whole complicated set of connections from primary visual cortex up to all these dozens of higher level visual processors. So, um, so to some extent, which region turns on when is just a function of when it gets input from some other region, which in turn is a function of what it's connected to, right? Um, but, but that's kind of talking about perceptual input driving the system. You can also, you know, as we just did a moment ago, close your eyes and you can think about this or you can think about that or you can think about the other thing. Um, and that's not coming off your sensory apparatus. That's coming out of some part of your mind, God knows where, probably the frontal lobes, who knows, right? where you are just deciding to think about different things and you know, controlling the knobs on your various processors to make them do different things. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about to what extent are these maps accurate when we look across populations? So, mm -hmm. because for example, speech, if, if the region is really at the same place or like at the approximately the same region for people of various cultures from across the world, it would suggest that speech is a homology, so evolutionary speaking, it developed once. So to what extent are these maps like? Oh, they're totally, in human populations, they're homologous, no question, right? That is, we don't, I mean, I, you know, I would dearly love to fly in 
you know, residents of remote, barely contacted Amazonian tribes and scan them on this whole paradigm. <laughs> but one, that's logistically complicated and two, probably unethical. Like they probably, can they deal, you know, it's like just for my, you know, anyway, so it would be nice to know that for, for sure, but I'm willing to bet a vast sum that no matter like where you were raised in the world, if we bring you here, we'll get that map. Where we do know, what we do know, so I mean, it's but it's it's true that the the vast majority of the research is done on you know college undergraduates. That's who's around near scanners, ready to be ready to go in there for you know relatively low pay. Um, uh, I will say that Ev Fedorenko has looked at her language regions. She said, okay, we're talking about those as the language regions in the human brain, so it's true for everybody. Let's find out. So she has scanned ba her basic sentences versus gobbledygook experiment on um, dozens of subjects speaking, uh, I think, at least 20 different languages. And you get exactly the same map, independent of language, which co-varies somewhat with culture, not totally with you know, socioeconomic status. So I guess I'd say there's room to look more broadly, which is hard to do, but possible. But everything we know suggests that these things are you know, just basic organization common to all humans. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I think. Did you have your hand up first? No. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, this is potentially proprietary, but what sort of uh, deep net are you using to approximate neural functioning? It's not that it's proprietary, it's just a whole saga. So, um, so very, um, and it's just we're right in the thick of it, so there's no really solid results yet. But uh, we're using AlexNet and uh, versions of VGG trained on just faces or just objects or both. And the basic finding is that, um, uh, is that there is a cost of sharing. If you try to train the same net on both faces and objects, there's a cost. And so to me that says, okay, you know, you gotta separate these things. And maybe that's why the brain does. There's much more to it than that and there's much more we need to do, but that's the gist of the idea, right? Um, all right, it's fine to just go on and answer questions and not do this, so we just keep asking and I'll, I'll proceed along. Okay, so we were gonna do these three questions. Um, I'm gonna do the first one because it's super fun, at least, and then we can decide what else there's time for. Okay, so let me remind you that functional MRI, great, you measure its response to an external stimulus, but it doesn't tell you that it's causally involved in that you know, perceptual or mental process that it responds during. Maybe you could knock it out and nothing would happen. Maybe it's just going along for the ride. Philosophers call that epiphenomenal, right? It's a thing that's just not part of the causal structure, right? It might, it's presumably part of some other causal structure, right? So, but, but in science, we really need to know about causality. We care not just that two things happen together. We need to know, did this one cause that one? Did that one cause that one? Or were they both caused by something else? That's just of the essence in science, right? So we need to know, um, and functional MRI isn't gonna tell us, so we gotta use other methods. So I got a phone call a few years ago from a collaborator, and he told me that this gentleman over here uh, was in Japan awaiting neurosurgery for, in, for drug resistant epilepsy. So most people who have epilepsy respond well to drugs that, that uh, prevent the seizures, but a certain percent of people with epilepsy are not responsive to drugs, and if the epilepsy is really bad, it's really um, you know, crippling, like you just can't have a normal life. So under those extreme circumstances, people sometimes elect neurosurgery. So it's pretty intense. They basically go in, find the focus of the seizure and cut it out. So often what the neurosurgeons do in those cases is open up the skull. It's pretty horrifying. I won't show you all the bloody pictures. Most people who do this research try to like score macho points by throwing like really gross, showing really gross bloody pictures. Anyway. It's really intense, you take out a big bone flap and you stick electrodes right on the surface of the human brain, or in this case, underneath the bottom of the human brain. And you do that for two reasons. One, to kind of triangulate and figure out where the seizures are, seizures are coming from. You wait till the patient has a seizure and then it's like, I don't exactly know how they do it, but I picture it's like localizing where, a, where an earthquake happened from a bunch of sensors around the world. It's like, woo, triangulate, right? Um, and they also do it to map out functions. If there's some like really important function, that they find an, under some electrode, it's like, we'll try to not go through there en route to that seizure focus, okay? So that's why they do this clinically. But of course, for scientists, oh my God, what an opportunity, right? So I was lamenting before that functional MRI has terrible temporal resolution, doesn't tell us anything about the causality, but here's a case where we get both. When the patient is willing to you know, do our experiments, 
It's like they hang out in the hospital for a week with nothing else to do with electrodes in their head and we're like, do you mind looking at our pictures and letting us record from your brain? And if they're nice, we get like the most awesome data ever. Okay. All right. So, uh, for, so this is where the electrodes are on the bottom of his brain. And for comparison, that's my brain. The red bits are the face selective bits, the green bits scene selective, and purple bits uh, color preferring bits. Okay. So you can see those electrodes are right on top of some good stuff. Uh, for example, right here, this is, this is right along the fusiform gyrus. Those electrodes correspond to these here. And you can see that this electrode right up there in the fusiform gyrus, this is time here, and this is a response of that electrode to faces in red and to other, other stimuli in all the other colors, faces and everything else. So when I showed you those bar charts at the beginning, with faces up here and not just up here, if you were kind of unimpressed, OK, big deal, not that selective. That's because functional MRI has a lot of blurring with blood flow. If you get the real deal and you record from the surface of the brain, we're talking serious selectivity, right? Like no response to anything else, OK? So that's just, and, and you can see the time course here. Uh, this thing kicks on in right around 150 milliseconds after the stimulus comes on. It's awesome data. So that valid, that's, you know, it's complementary to the MRI data. It validates it with a more direct measure of neural activity. But really, the saga I started with is what happens? Can we test the causal role? So what happens when that part of the brain is electrically stimulated through that same electrode? The neurosurgeons do this as a way to map out function. Okay? So I'll show you a videotape of what happens. Um, and is Chris back there? I'll probably need him for the audio. Or maybe it'll just happen. Whoops. Okay, here we go. Um, so this guy, here he is. He's getting stimulated here, and he's looking at his neurologist. And he says, your face completely changed. You can read the transcript. It's such a good subject, yeah. One more time. Remember, he doesn't know there's a face area. He doesn't know where those electrodes are. But when they're stimulated, here's what he reports. He's just told, tell us if anything changes. Okay, so that shows that it's causally involved in face perception. Here the question is, is it causally involved in perceiving other things that aren't faces? So we show him, in this case, a, a box. And he says... No He's looking at a box and he sees a face on it. Okay, this is a kanji character on a card right there. He's getting zapped. Nothing came in through his eyes. We just directly reach in there with electrical current, stimulate that little patch of brain, and he sees a face. No matter what he's looking at, it doesn't change the shape of the box or the ball or the kanji. He just sees a face on top. So it shows you both the causal role and the specificity of the causal role. Yeah. 
so when you activate those areas, are the like, are the eyes just like cut off because that is being overstimulated, or are you can you still see like the oh, so What do you what? When you said um, oh the input so from the eyes, face, he would map a face onto an object. Yeah. Um. So is he seeing both inputs from? Both yeah, eyes it's it's a good question. Um, as far as we can tell, so we have about 45 minutes of video where they did this multiple times, like all up and down those electrodes. Only the face selective electrodes that respond selectively to faces do this. None of the other ones do. Um, and as far as we can tell, he sees the other object. He reports it. He just sees a face on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, so does did you have more studies where you saw if they, the part of the face is more specialized in certain features? Because he says like his eyes and nose mm -hmm. only change, not his mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. It looks like there's several studies, uh, one from monkeys, um, other little hints that eyes are particularly important. I mean, eyes are pretty distinctive faces, right? Probably more than noses and mouths even, right? Um, and in another patch, um, you know, another electrode nearby that was also face selective, he reported, I see many tiny eyes, right? Which is very suggestive, right? Um, so yeah, it looks like there may be, going a little bit beyond the data, there may be a bit of a hierarchy of processing along there where you represent the features like the eyes and a higher level one where you represent a whole face. But we don't totally, we haven't totally nailed that yet. Did you have a question as well? So I was wondering, um, what face do they see when you actually um, kind of stimulate it? Is it a specific thing that they had already in mind? Is it like something that they just saw? And yeah, well, all we know is what he said. And so he says it looks like an anime character. Um, there's another report from a few years ago from a different lab where they did something like this on a different patient. Um, and that's also quite a spectacular video. The patient who's speaking English that makes it all the more vivid He's looking at the neurologist and he goes, whoa, you just turned into somebody else, like somebody I knew before. Um, and he goes, that was a trip. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all we have are these little specks of report. So it seems like, you know, it changes, in his case, it changes to a perfectly reasonable face, just a different person than the one he's actually looking at. In this guy, it seems to change to an anime character. And why that would be, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Where where do like the mathematician comps that will come into play when they like, answer these questions in terms of like connectivity, kind of mapping different brain like, like, that type of thing? I mean, what kind of research do they do? Yeah, like, like, like how, how do they play into that like, your bigger question of how do you get this causal model and how do these brain regions kind of? Well, they don't here. We don't need any math or computer science for this. We need yeah. a neurosurgeon right. and a willing patient. And electrodes in the right place for clinical reasons, which is like almost never happens, right? So this is like, you know, I'll probably never get another case like this, mm -hmm. right? So this is not a case, I mean, there are many, many cases, many different aspects of human cognitive neuroscience where math and computer science are of the essence, are absolutely essential. And you'll, you've just pinged me to do my little mini lecturette. If you're interested in this field, like there's no some, no thing no such thing as too much math and too much computer science, and though I hate to say it and it's kind of heretical, like if you have to figure out, am I going to spend my time taking this extra fancy math or computer science course or one more neuroscience course, do the math course, you know, <laughs> um, because there it, it, our field is just getting more and more mathematical, um, and it's just going to keep happening. And you know you can learn the basic concepts in neuroscience at any point, but I think really getting a deep um, grasp of math and deep coding skills, MATLAB and everything else, um, will just open all kinds of doors for you. You know, plus if you know all hell breaks loose and we lose all funding for science, you will have other options more than if you just study neuroscience. So there are many, many reasons to do that. I probably overstated it. But anyway, learn lots of math and computer science. Yes. Yeah, so what are the levels of abstraction with this? Because if I look at, at the face, I mean, of course, I have a region of the brain that is responsive to faces. But at the same time, I could imagine that the region that is responsive to colors is also active. Oh, should we find out? Sorry, finish your question and then we'll find out. Yeah, so, I mean, how far can I go with this? Because the region that is responsible for shapes might also be active to classify the shape of the head of that person. So can I, if I, for example, in this experiment, 
affect the region responsible for color, make that person still see the eyes but not be able to? Let's find out. Great that you ask. Conveniently, right next to that electrode we just saw is another pair of electrodes that respond preferentially to color, matching prior data from functional MRI. Let's see what happens when they zap those electrodes. Okay? He's looking at the box. Again, he doesn't know that there are color parts of the brain or where he's getting zapped. Here, and he says, Okay, so what happens here? This is sort of your question. You'll see. He'll tell us. If I look at the face, he knows it's a face. That's the kanji. So what that shows is it's not just that you know, we're predisposed to see faces everywhere. We kind of are. There's lots of cortex that does faces. We're social primates. We care about faces. But um, if you zap right next door in a region that does something else, you get a totally different causal role. I think you had your hand up first. It was a simple question. Were they zapping his right hemisphere? Yeah. Okay. So that's why he sees it on the left. Like he says, he doesn't know any of this. He's like, there's a rainbow on the left half of your face. He keeps going like this, a rainbow over here. Rainbow over here. That's because it's a color patch in the right hemisphere. Yeah. Um, so now the next question would be, okay, so if we know that perception can be like put into categories, like, okay, this is the part of the brain that is responsible for shapes. Some part of the brain needs to consolidate all this information to give us that perception. <laughs> so what's that region? <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be nice to know? Yeah, wouldn't that be nice to know? I suspect there isn't one cosmic region where it all comes together. Um, many people have puzzled over this, but you're right, there must be some way, at the very least, to know which features go with which. Like, here's a simple case. If I show you, um, you know, a red-tinted face and a blue-tinted house, how do you know that that's a red face and a blue house rather than a red house and a blue face, right? It's not enough to just have all those pools of neurons signaling their preferred features. This is known as the binding problem. A lot of neuroscientists will tell you, oh, it's not a problem. But it is a problem, right? I mean, there may, it may be some straightforward way the, the visual system solves it, but it's not enough to just have a bunch of neurons recording their features. We need to know what goes with what. And there, there's much theorizing about that and mostly not real answers. Yeah. So in some points, the subject says that he can only see half a rainbow or that half a picture change. Would you be able to predict when that might happen based on the simulation or where the simulation occurred. And the second thing, how finely were you able to control the simulation and how fine would you like it? Okay, so so the reason he sees only the half rainbow, we are pretty sure, is because he's zapped in the other hemisphere. And everything in the visual cortex is contralateral. So he sees it in the other hemisphere, and that's all there is to that. Um, how finely can I do this? It's totally not up to me, and rightfully so. It's up to the neurosurgeons. Right? If, God forbid, any of you end up having neurosurgery, you don't want me telling the neurosurgeon, oh, stick it over there, please. You know, take out, an <clears throat> take it on an extra bit or stimulate. No, 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 no. Not ethical, right? So the neurosurgeon has to decide what they need to do for clinical reasons. This particular neurosurgeon is, you know, very worried about making people lose their face recognition ability. So he goes to lengths to make sure he knows which are the face selective patches so that he can steer around them. Most neurosurgeons don't bother with that. They're more worried about language. You know, neurosurgeons have their own idiosyncrasies of what they are obsessed about. Um, but anyway, it's not up to me. I'm sorry, that was your question. Look at the wrong person. Right? It's not up to me um, when and where and how they stimulate. Um, but yeah, of course, it would be awesome to get even finer grain data and even more of it. There are people who collect single unit data from human brains using electrodes. 
Uh, and I do hope that we will have more access to these kind of data in future. There's a new neurosurgeon who was just hired at MGH, Mass General Hospital, and he's lovely and really wants to collaborate. And so he and I and Ev Fedorenko are trying to set up a whole center for human intracranial research. Um, and you know we'll see how that goes. But the idea is to increase the amount of intracranial data we can get because it is the most powerful data in human cognitive neuroscience, I think. And right now it's extremely rare and precious. Yeah. Yeah. This is just me having crazy ideas, but it may be even a sci-fi um, abstraction. But it's, it seems like there are no limits to the kinds of uh, experiences we can uh, make people have. You know, if we plug them in the right way. So I don't know. I think it's really well. Cool. There are technical limits. Right, the reason that we can make this person see faces and see rainbows is that there are parts of the brain that are specialized for faces and specialized for color. Right? We can't, you know, at least at present, you know, even, even if the patient was willing, is it okay, stick the electrodes anywhere, I want to see, you know, a pink elephant. I don't know how to do that, right? Well, actually, you might, even, you, might, you might be able to get close. I mean, I don't know, a pink animal maybe, right? And that is, we only know how to do that when there are particular parts of the brain that have the relevant selectivities. And I started by showing you the main ones that are most robust. There's a few other kind of sort of ones and other people would have slightly different maps than the one I showed you, but they're not unlimited, right? And there's a certain grain, right? We can't, we can't tell them which face to see, right? Now, with rodents, you can do all that kind of stuff, right? Optogenetics, you can show them a you know, very particular image, record exactly which you know, pool of neurons respond at the single unit level to that particular image. You can play it back later. You can do all that stuff, like an amazing causal precision in rodents, right? So, but in humans, this is kind of as good as it gets in humans at present. I mean, you know, that's not quite true. There are people who use other kinds of electrodes. So there's something called a Utah array that's used mostly in monkeys. It's like a little, you know, I don't know, two or three millimeter by two or three millimeter uh, pin cushion, like a bed of nails, <laughs> electrodes, that you stick in an animal brain and they have 100 electrodes in this little patch, little 10 by 10 grid. And there are a few people who have had those embedded in the humans who've had those embedded in their brains. People, for example, who are paralyzed due to spinal injuries and who want to be able to control robotic arms by readout from their brain and their labs that are doing that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you've probably seen some of the videos of robotic control of, I mean, control of robotic arms from, from brains. Um, you know, you can, it works kind of sort of, yeah. Um, but you can't make people think a certain thought now by stimulating their brain. You can make them see certain kinds of percepts, the kinds that we have known brain specializations for. That's about the grain you can do it at now. For now. For now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, yeah, if you had a whole huge array of electrodes and you recorded from a huge number of stimuli so that you had a sense of the neural code for each of those things, you might be able to play some stuff back. I don't know, it would probably be pretty lousy. Yeah. Um, okay. So all of that was just on the first question. Strikingly specific causal role of those two patches of brain. The face specific region is only causally involved in face perception. The color preferring region is apparently only causally involved in perceiving color. Um, shall I just go on with other specialization? I'll just go on and you can butt in with questions and who cares whether we get through it or not. How's that? Okay. Um, all right. So. An obvious question, you look at this and you say, in fact, it's related to your question. How far would this go? What else is in there, right? There's all this gray brain where I haven't put anything up there. Well, some of that is just my ignorance, parts of literature I don't follow. Um, but some of it is just things where, you know, there's kind of more amorphous functions that are harder to stick a simple word label on. Um, but there may be lots of other good stuff in there, right? Do you have a question? Yeah, well, related to that, it, it seems like there's got to be some balance specialization and sort of general function because if you don't have an unlimited number of neurons, you can't you know, map every specific thing that you need to do in the environment to. Absolutely. So is that something that... Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to know why these functions and apparently not lots of others we've looked for. We've looked for all kinds of other things and not found them. Things that seem to make sense. How about visual responses to food or snakes? 
or spiders, right? We can tell all kinds of stories. Or cards, we look at them all the time, right, for different arguments. We don't see any of those things. Now, the fact that we don't see them doesn't mean that they're not there. They could be there at a finer grain than our current resolution can see. Or, you know, various, there's various other ways to not see things that are actually in there. Uh, but the point is, at the level that we can robustly see all of these things, there's a lot of stuff we don't see. And so that raises the question of why these and why not those others? Yeah? Would the not having a region specialized for cards suggest that at least a fair number of these regions are things that you know, develop much earlier in the course of Could be. Could be that they develop earlier, but then we'd have to say why, right? Um, so the computational stuff we're trying to do, the hypothesis we're testing, is that if you train a deep net to do both generic object recognition and face recognition, there's going to be a cost of sharing if the same net has to do both. Whereas, if you train a deep net on object recognition and car recognition, there won't be. And if all that works, plus a whole lot of controls I'm leaving out, we will make an argument that that's consistent with the idea that the reason we have a specialized patch of brain for face recognition is that it's just a very different set of computations from object recognition. They don't work well together in the same network, and it's better to segregate them. And the reason there isn't a separate patch for car recognition is that the same feature set that works for object recognition works great for car recognition. That's the kind of thing we're testing. Is it, like necessary, you, is it necessarily like purely a computational problem, or could it be that like you, it's just a particularly important patch? Totally. You're t absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So one hypothesis is that it comes out of the computational requirements of the task, right? Another hypothesis is these things matter evolutionarily, and they're innate, and they're wired in, right? Totally possible. Third possibility, we see these things early in life, and we care about them, and we look at them a lot, and the cortex is plastic, and the first few patches grab the first few things that happen, and you know, there's like a cortical land grab for the things you see a lot. Absolutely. All those are on the table, and there are other possibilities, but those are the main ones on the table, and amazingly, we basically don't know the answer to that for any of these regions. Yeah? I think having these generic regions is also very constructive to learning, because once you get objects that are like abstract, or you're presented with something new in your life that you have never encountered before, by having these generic regions that kind of combine shape and color, you can rely on schemas to kind of be able to categorize that object into like a okay, how do I deal with it evolutionary? Is it a threat, threat for me or not? Whereas, if you have two specialized regions of your brain that are specialized <laughs> on recognizing cars, the evolutionary trade-off is just too high. If you are represented with a new object, you might misclassify it. That's right. You can't classify it. That's right. So clearly, we need a way to represent stuff for which there's no prior evolutionary history. And actually, that visual word form area I talked about, I didn't go through this whole argument, but one of the many reasons it's interesting is it's clear it's not a product of evolution, in the sense that humans have only been reading for a few thousand years. That's not enough time for evolution to have wired it in. right? So that's the one case where we know that's a product of individual experience, not evolutionary experience. But for, and so it's a, it's a kind of existence proof. Maybe the same thing is true for the face and place regions, but maybe not. Those have mattered for a long time through human history, through human evolution, and maybe they're hardwired. Yeah. So, um, for people who are blind who cannot see, um, how does it change for them this area? Great question. That's my. This is the last experiment I'm going to talk about. So we can skip over some stuff and do that. Or um, how about we're supposed to end at 1:30? Is that right? Okay. Okay. Why don't you? I'll assign you. I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Kara. Sarah. Sarah. I'll assign you to sound the gong at 1.20 if I haven't gotten to the blind study by then, okay? We'll skip to it, because it's cool. Uh, anyway, you guys are all raising all the central questions in the field, so that's great, good for you. Um, okay, so what other specializations? We've been looking at a few. Um, here's a wild one that we just reported a couple years ago. A little patch roughly there responds when you look at not just another person, there's a whole suite of brain regions that respond when you look at a person's face or their body, when you think about their mood, when you think about what they're doing, there's a whole lot of stuff like that. But this region responds when you look at two people who are interacting with each other. And if you think about it, we care a lot about that. We care not just what is the properties of this individual, we care what is the property of this pair of people? Are they friends? Are they enemies? Are they being nice to each other? Are they not? 
that's kind of really important. In fact, that's the main way you find out who's nice and who's not, is by finding out how treat people treat other people, right? In fact, infants three and four months old can distinguish between little animations of uh, a, a shape that's helping another shape versus hindering another shape by three months, right? And that brain region can do that. It detects uh, social interactions and, it can dis and you can read out the pattern there and tell whether that social interaction is a helping one or a hindering one. So that's kind of cool. We are also in collaboration with Josh Tannenbaum looking at a bunch of regions roughly there that we think are involved in reasoning about the physical world. So it's obvious that you know, humans are social primates and care deeply about other people and what they're thinking and doing and what they look like and all that stuff. But we also care about the physical world, right? So you cannot make a single action in the world without doing a little bit of reasoning about the physics of the world you're acting on, right? So if I pick up this cup, I need to have reasoned about what does it weigh, what will be the friction of the surface. Those things both tell me how hard I need to squeeze to pick it up. I need to prepare myself for how much effort it is going to be to pick it up. Um, if I decide to you know, walk over here, I need to know that this surface is going to support my weight. Um, I you know, know that I can't just walk this way. I will bump into something that I can't pass through. Um, all these kinds of things are essential in every single action you make on the world. And I hear, I'm not a roboticist, but I hear, mostly from Josh Tannenbaum, that roboticists have cottoned onto this and realized that you can't get a robot to do much until you build in some kind of model of the physics of the world. So we've been doing some early days uh, functional imaging studies, and we think that those regions, they seem to be preferentially engaged when you do uh, different kinds of reasoning about the physical world. And there's much more to be done, but, but we're, we're working on that. Um, and um, I will just, how am I gonna do this? Maybe I'll just tell you this without the slides because I can be more efficient that way. Um, a few years ago in collaboration with Josh McDermott, we decided to look at auditory cortex. And that's particularly fun because you know, everybody and their mother studies visual cortex and there are just tens of thousands of publications. It's very crowded and it's very advanced, it's a good solid field, they've discovered all this stuff. But auditory cortex is kind of like the Wild West. There's like a bunch of papers, but not that many. And so you can just like play, right? So um, we said, okay, let's look at the overall organization of human auditory cortex. And in contrast to everything I've described so far, where we make up a crazy hypothesis and then go look in the brain for evidence for it. I was like, okay, is there specialization for faces? Yes, snakes, no, bodies, yes, right, like that. You know, and then you have to do a lot of stuff to refine your hypothesis. We said, okay, let's, let's scan people while they listen to a large number of natural sounds. And then let's do data-driven analyses. Let's kind of shake the data and let the data tell us what the structure is in there, yeah? So basically what we did was we collected the 165 most commonly heard natural sounds that you can recognize from a two-second clip, okay? So it's stuff like, um, you know, man speaking, flushing toilet, pouring liquid, tooth brushing, woman speaking, car accelerating, biting and chewing, animal sounds, stuff like that, right? So we have 165 sounds and we scan 10 people and we take all of the top of their temporal lobe, which is sort of greater suburban auditory cortex, like the whole big chunk of auditory responsive cortex. And we represent all the data in this one big matrix. So these are voxels, the little uh, pixels in the MRI data across here, 11,000 of them across 10 subjects in auditory cortex. And here are the 165 sounds. So each column, is the response of one little patch of one person's brain to each of the 165 sounds. Everybody got that? So this is like a representation of all the data from this big experiment, okay? So then we do a bunch of math on that matrix to say, give me a simple description of that matrix, right? The particular math we did was a variant of independent component analysis. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't really matter. The idea is this is totally hypothesis neutral because the math, it doesn't have any labels. The math is just giving us pulling out the basic structure in there, right? And then once we get the structure out, we add the labels back and we see awesome stuff. Okay, so um, we find that six components account for 80% of the variance in that whole big matrix. Now, that doesn't mean there's only six kinds of neurons in auditory cortex. In part, it's a statement about how lousy functional MRI is in resolution, 
but it's still a nice concrete number you can work with. Okay, six components accounts for most of, the, most of that data. What are they? So now we can stick the labels back on and look at them. And four of them are intuitive things that we sort of knew or suspected before, like selectivity for high frequencies and low frequencies. That's known as tonotopy. Primary auditory cortex has a map of frequency space. So just as primary visual cortex has a map of visual space, if you look at that inflated cortex, you see a whole map of space. In auditory cortex, you have a map of frequency space. And so we rediscover that, two of our components are tonotopy. That's nice, because when you rediscover things you already knew, that's called a positive control. It's like, okay, this method is doing the right thing. Two others were not exactly known, but they were sort of suspected, kind of acoustic-y properties of sounds. And here are my favorite two. Okay, here's one. This is component five, and this is its magnitude of response to each of the 165 sounds. Okay, the sounds are color-coded by category. So if we then average within a category, we see this. So what is this? It responds a lot to foreign speech and English speech, and oh, what is that blue thing? That would be music with vocals. So this, and you know, non-speech vocalizations are way down there. So this is a speech selective response, okay? That has just emerged out of the data. We didn't go in saying, oh, is there speech selectivity? We said, okay, explain this big chunk of data with the basic components, and it's one of the basic components. Okay, so people had reported speech selectivity before. They hadn't done it with anywhere near so many sounds. So their evidence for its selectivity is not as good as ours. Um, this, is, this is better, but it was sort of building on stuff that was sort of suspected. But component six, nobody had seen before. And here's component six. Okay, what's all that blue and purple stuff? Well, let's average within category. We see instrumental music, vocal music, and everything else. That's a music selective response in the human auditory cortex. Isn't that cool? Um, so that hadn't been seen before. And part of the reason it hadn't been seen before is in this case, you actually need all the fancy math. You need all the fancy math because what the ICA does is basically account for the response of each little pixel or voxel in terms of a linear weighted sum of the response of each of those components and those neural populations overlap. And if I just lost you, it doesn't matter. It's just a case where we needed the math to see it here. You don't see it if you just look for this with the standard MRI methods. Um, and, but this result is cool for all kinds of reasons. Um, we can project them back in the brain and we we'll skip that. First of all, this is a complete dissociation between speech and music. And that's cool because nobody knows why humans have music in the first place. All human societies have it. No non-human animal has it. No whale song, bird song doesn't count. We could, we could fight about that, but it really doesn't count in all kinds of ways. Um, and nobody knows why we have it. And so one of the major stories has been that we know why humans have language and speech. It confers like obvious evolutionary advantages to be able to share information with your conspecifics, right? But everyone since Darwin has puzzled over this. Darwin considered music one of the big puzzles of human evolution, because unlike um, language and all the other stuff, there was no obvious adaptive function. But one of the main stories people have said is once you have mechanisms for speech and language, you can use them to do music. It's not all that different. It's auditory. It unfolds over time. It's got hierarchical structure. You can use the same machinery. And this says, oh no, you're not using the same machinery. Not at all. Totally different parts of the brain, right? So it doesn't tell us why we have music, but it rules out that hypothesis. Will people who are deaf um, have this area deactivated? By what? <laughs> I mean, so the question that Sarah asked a moment ago is parallel, but you got to think about what would you, how would you ask that? What would be your analog of something that they could perceive? Obviously, there's no point in playing the music if they can't hear anything at all. Nothing will respond because they can't hear, right? Sorry? She said vibration. Yeah, you could try vibrations. But then that would be a better question to ask of auditory cortex in general, unless you think there's a vibration correlate of music. Actually, I think there is. I heard this, I forget her name, but this um, uh, quite well-known drummer who's deaf. Um, yeah, do you know her name? But there are a lot of deaf musicians in general. Really? Yeah. Okay, so, so you'd have to play with that space. Yeah. And as far as I know, nobody's tried that. Was there another question over here? Oh, Amantana, yeah. Did you try to disrupt with TMS one or the other region? Um, 
that has, uh, they're kind of, well, they're kind of deep. Be, it's not impossible. They're right underneath the ear, which is kind of inconvenient. You can stick the coil right there, it'd be weird. Anyway, so as far as I know, people haven't done that. Um, it would be cool. The music thing would be hard, because as I say, those neural populations are sort of overlapping. Um, but let me just mention one other thing, and then we'll talk about the blind study. Um, so anyway, for all those reasons, I think the music thing is totally cool. But whenever you find something that amazing, your first response should be, really? And in my case, it's like, okay, we went through a tunnel of math, and out the other end came music. Okay. <laughs> How do we know whether it was confabulated by the math or if it's really in there, right? Um, and so luckily, we've had the amazing opportunity to um, record, do basically do the same experiment in people with electrodes in their head for neurosurgery. Okay, so we just submitted to science and got rejected, this paper, but we, it's, it's a great paper. They just weren't thinking clearly. <laughs> anyway, um, so here are, um, 13 neurosurgery subjects with electrodes over temporal lobe auditory cortex. The red ones are the ones in each subjects that responded systematically to sound. Um, and I'll just show you a few, there's cool electrodes. Okay, so here's a single electrode from a single subject. Um, and this is its response to those same 165 sounds averaging over the foreign speech, native speech, and vocal music. So that's a speech selective electrode, right? And we see lots and lots of those. Those have been reported before, but they're still fun to see. Um, and here is a music selective electrode, uh, vocal music and instrumental music, and everything else. Now, the cool thing about this, it's not just that that's a direct electrical recording from the surface of the brain, and so that's closer to the neural source. There's no fancy math here. That's just the response of that electrode, period, okay? So that one, validates our ICA method, the stuff we discovered with the fancy math turns out to be true when you get better recording methods even without the fancy math, right? And two, what a cool discovery, right? All right? Let me do one more thing first. And then, so that was awesome enough, and then we found something else we didn't, this, these were sort of predicted from the MRI data that I described before, but then we found something we did not predict from the MRI data, we didn't see it with the MRI data, but you can see it with intracranial electrodes. And that is, some electrodes are so specific, they only respond to singing, music with vocals. Much lower response to instrumental music and to speech. It's not just the sum of responses to speech and music, it's its own separate thing, vocal music. Now, there's some people up at Harvard who've been writing all this evolutionary speculation. I'm trying to be polite by calling it speculation instead of other various acronyms. Um, <laughs> And there's like, oh, you know, vocal music, it's a native form of music. It's like people were doing that first before they had instruments and blah, 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 blah. And it's particularly important in social <laughs> perception. I thought, oh, what a bunch of acronyms, right? But hey, you know, this doesn't necessarily prove they're right, but it seems like there's something special in the brain about vocal music. So, um, okay. Yeah, was there a question there? Is there an overlap between the two regions that are dealing with speech and music for the song, for vocal music specifically? Or? Uh, okay, do, are, do you mean, does the vocal music right next to the speech and... Uh, so, I guess? Yeah, it seems to be separate, right? I mean, like, all those things are nearby. They're all in auditory cortex. We don't have ele enough electrodes to really tell. Roughly, it looks like if from the MRI and a little bit of speculation on these data, it looks like if this is the top of the temporal lobe like this, you have primary auditory cortex right, that, right there in a region called Heschel's gyrus. Just below that is a band of speech selective cortex, and just below that is a band of language specific cortex. Language cortex meaning it cares about meaning, not just sounds. You can read a sentence and it will respond. Speech cortex cares about the sounds of speech and doesn't care about meaning. And the music region is like in front and behind, two little patches. It's sort of, we're not totally sure, but that's what it looks like, yeah. Did they respond the same way to songs that they could understand and it was in their language, or they, the songs that were not in their language? Um. Uh, I don't think we have enough data to tell, but I'd be really shocked if it cares because it does not care at all about native versus foreign speech. They're right on top of each other down here. So it'd be weird if it cared only in the case of music, right? Do you think you would see differences between musicians and non-musicians? Oh, great question. By which I mean, we're doing that experiment right now. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, we're doing the MRI version of the experiment. Um, we is Dana Bo Bobinger, grad student in my lab, working with me and Josh McDermott. And she has scanned, uh, I think, 12 um, really serious musicians, not like, you know, Carnegie Hall, but like, you know, they've been practicing many, many hours a day for like 15 years, started by the time they were six, like extreme musicians with no musical training at all. And the basic story is the brain responses are really similar. They might be slightly more selective in the trained musicians than the people with no musical training. And so we've been struggling a lot to figure out if there's a tiny effect or no, a tiny difference or no difference. But the main story is all those music selective responses are there even in the untrained musicians. Now, importantly, that means no explicit musical training. All of our subjects hear music. In fact, they hear it before they're born. They hear music in the womb, right? A lot of sounds get in there. So none of that means it's innate. It just means you don't have to be explicitly trained. Yeah. So you said before that you're really excited for a way to uh, verify your music form concept with the uh, subject, and then here there are more subjects and that the, the neurosurgeon is needed and things like that. So I was wondering how often, uh, well, how often do you wait between verifying these sorts of things? Or do people email you and they're like, oh, maybe you can, this stuff takes forever. Like this was like, f this was like at least four years of, you know, what, you know, two, sometimes three subjects a year. You know, that's just, just not that many. But the data are so precious that basically whenever we get a phone call and there's a neurosurgery patient, it's like, okay, all hands on deck, everybody drops everything else, that's the priority. And you can see why. When you see stuff like that, you're like, okay, that's worth it. Yeah, yeah. Do you expect that you could uh, produce or, or cause uh, the people who have the electrodes implanted in that those areas to experience uh, the sounds like the speech. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? That would be yet stronger evidence for the causal role of those regions. We've tried it a couple times and not a damn thing happened and none of us know why. Um, I suppose I could argue that that means these are irrelevant, have nothing to do with perception. I can't believe that. These findings are so striking. So hopefully we'll get a shot, but we've only had a couple so far and nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. So do you have an idea of what feature it might be detecting, like in particular, you know, speech reading versus like music and songs? Okay, it's a good question. Yeah, let me just, yeah, we don't know, but I will tell you one thing, which is, you know, the first thing you should worry about whenever anybody shows you something crazy like this is, okay, speech, music, these are complicated, they have a million different properties. How do you know this isn't just the presence of certain particular acoustic features that are more common in music than speech or, or vice versa, right? Totally possible. The reason we know in our case is that Josh McDermott and Sam Norman Hegner and others made these amazing methods where you can take a little audio clip and permute it in various ways to get another clip that is matched in acoustic properties but doesn't sound at all like the original one. I'm leaving out all the details, but he, he's basically devised very cool ways to do that. And when you compare those two sounds, primary auditory cortex produces exactly the same response, which is what you want, right? The early stages of processing do the same thing. And yet, the higher level uh, regions respond totally differently. And that tells you that these selectivities are not accountable for by simpler pro acoustic properties of the stimuli. But you know what, I'm gonna do that blind study. So your hand was going up for? Um, so in the study that you did before, you showed people some objects and then you stimulated that part of their brain and they saw eyes or some part yeah. of their face. Could you play for these people, play some sort of vibration on their ear and then stimulate that part and see if they can hear something? In principle, I have to make that prediction. But as I say, we tried a you know rudimentary version of that once and it didn't work. So who knows? Yeah. Um, okay, let me tell you very briefly about the blind study. I'll skip all the other stuff. Okay, so um, how does all this stuff get wired up in development? So, you know, in the same, these things are in the same place across subjects. How does the brain know to do that? Why does it wire up these things, not others? Um, briefly, Rebecca Sachs has shown that even six month old infants show a similar layout of the face and scene regions. This is an adult, that's an infant. That similarity tells you that some of that structure is already there by six months. It's not yet adult-like, but a lot of it is there. Um, but really we wanna know not just when the stuff develops, but how, and in particular, what's the role of experience? And that's why your question about blind people, 
is a great one. And so we've been looking at this recently, uh, my postdoc Ratan Murthy uh, and some other collaborators. And so we asked the question of whether you need to see faces during development uh, for face selectivity to arise in your brain, right? To get a fusiform face area. And we are not the first ones to ask this question. There's a bunch of studies of which the most impressive is a one that was published um, a couple of years ago where, first of all, you see face selective regions in monkey brains. You scan them with functional MRI. You see patches in sort of homologous regions, just like you see in humans. But now, because those were monkeys, they could raise those monkeys without ever letting them see a face. So those monkeys had normal uh, auditory experience. They were on the other side of a curtain from their uh, you know, fellow monkeys. They uh, can smell monkeys and hear monkeys, and they get lots of cuddling by human caregivers who had uh, welders masks over their faces. Okay, so they have lots of visual experience, lots of social experience, but no face experience. And those monkeys have no face selective patches. Okay, so these guys concluded that seeing faces is necessary for face domain formation. Right? See, face domain just means face selective bit of cortex. People fight over terminology, but it means the same thing. A perfectly reasonable conclusion from their very impressive study. However, around the same time, a former postdoc of mine, his lab published a paper with the following title. Development of visual category selectivity in ventral visual cortex does not require visual experience. He based that on studies of blind subjects listening to different sounds. Okay, I'm totally running out of time and I have an appointment at 1.30, so I'm gonna accelerate. So basically, we scanned blind subjects looking at a feeling stimuli like this. They're lying in the scanner, they have this disc on their belly, they're feeling these things, and um, that disc is rotating and their hand is like this, and the objects go by and they feel the objects, okay? So they're feeling faces and scenes, mazes, hands and chairs, okay? And then we look, um, and sighted subjects looking at those stimuli show face selective responses on their fusiform gyrus, like that. That's the normal face selective response in sighted subjects looking at those stimuli. Um, that's a group analysis. Um, congenitally blind subjects show similar face selectivity for touching faces versus touching scenes and bodies and chairs, scenes and hands and chairs. Okay? Not all subjects do, but more than half do. And in the group analysis, the location is really similar in the brain. So um, that tells us, and here's a uh, profile of response in sighted subjects. You see that selectivity uh, for sighted subjects, and it's really similar in blind subjects. Okay? So um, we think that this is a fusiform face area in congenitally blind subjects. Apparently, um, you don't need to see faces to de develop face selectivity there. Um, it doesn't, however, tell us that that region is innate um, because blind subjects uh, feel faces. Now, they don't do it much. If you ask them or you Google it, you find all these web pages where blind people are, are writing things like, how come sighted people are always asking us if we want to feel their faces? That's disgusting. Why would we want to do that, right? So apparently it's just not a thing, you know. Nonetheless, blind people surely feel their own faces sometimes, doll faces occasionally. So we can't make an extreme innateness claim that there's never been any face experience, but certainly there's been no visual face experience and that same region is there. And so that's a pretty powerful constraint on how it develops. I'm so sorry to run out, but I do have another appointment that I can't be too late for. Um, but if you guys have other questions, you can shoot me emails or whatever. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.